Dr. Yu, are you able to see my screen? Yeah. This is your scenario. There is some sort of distortion in your mic. Okay. Okay, are you ready? Hello? Yes, Dr. Liu. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm giving you a timer and I will prompt you at six minutes, okay? Okay. Okay, and your time starts now. Hello, good evening. I'm, Hello, good uh, evening. I'm Dr. Neil, Dr. in the clinic today. Am I talking to Mr. Navi, 36 years old? Yes, I am. Mr. Navi, uh, I've learned that uh, you have some uh, loose motion. Could you tell me more about that? Yes, Doctor, I am having the loose motions. and It's been now three months, I believe, that they're getting worse. Is it sudden or gradual onset? It was, of course, gradual onset. Um, how is it worsen uh, in the frequency? Of course, in the frequency. How many times do you pass a stool in a day? I pass, I believe, at least four or five times in 24 hours. Uh, is the, how many cups do you pass your stool at a time? In each episode, I believe that I am passing about two cups. Two cups. Is there any bread? No. Any mucus? No. Any undigested food in your stool? No. Uh, do you have any sense of incomplete uh, uh, incomplete evacuation? No. Uh, do you wake up at night to pass your stool from Absolutely. sleep? Absolutely. Uh, how many times do you need to wake up? I have to wake, I think, once or twice in the night to pass the loose tools. Do you have any associated tummy pain? Yes, sometimes I'm getting tummy pain. Okay, uh, where is your tummy pain? You can't say that this is tummy pain. This is some sort of discomfort. It is in my lower tummy. Okay, is that together with the uh, onset of the worsening loose tool? Mm, yes, off and on, I'm getting it. Yeah, how, how is the characteristic of the pain? Dull, boring ache. Okay, uh, how is, is that, is a pain ready to anywhere? This is not a pain, this is just a discomfort, a very mild discomfort, that's it, it is not radiating. Okay, um, anything that you do will uh, reduce the discomfort? 
Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Um, do you have any uh, weight loss? Mm, yes. What I believe is that I have lost about three kilograms of weight over three months. Three months. Okay. Uh, any appetite? Any loss of appetite? No. Okay. Uh, do you have any rash? No. Okay. Uh, do you have any increase in body temperature? No. Do you have any uh, weather preference? Mm, no. Okay. Uh, I, I also know that you have a uh, celiac disease. Can, can you tell me more about that? Uh, yes. Uh, I have been diagnosed with a case of celiac disease and I believe that now it's about two or three years. But trust me, it was well in control and I am avoiding all the wheat products. And especially, I am following the diet plan of my dietitian. Okay, uh, very good, very good. Uh, I also learned that you have a type 1 uh, diabetes, right? Yes. Can you tell me more about that? Uh, is that in control? Uh, yes, uh, I believe that I'm suffering from type 1 diabetes last one year and I try to be a good patient. I'm using insulin. Are you compliant to your insulin? Sometimes I'm missing the dosage. Okay. Uh, do you have any? Uh, are you? Uh, do you have any follow up under your eye doctor? Yes, I am under the follow up of my eye doctor and my GP. Okay. How? Uh, how's your treatment? Uh, glucose uh, sugar level? They were telling me that it was about eight point eight. Okay. Do you have any numbness or any tingling? Uh, in your foot or hands? No. Okay, uh, do you have any uh, uh, break sores in the skin that uh, uh, very hard to cure? No. No, okay. Uh, do you have uh, any, uh, do, do you take any other medications or uh, medications other than insulin? Uh, no, I'm not taking any other medications. Any recent antibiotic? Mm, no. Okay. Uh, do you have a? Uh, is there any family member having the similar problem like like you? Yes, my sister she is having celiac disease, and my mom she is having IBD, and okay. my dad he has been diagnosed with a case of tropical. There is some distortion, Doctor New, at your end in your mic. Okay. Uh, wait is it better now? It is better. Still, there is distortion. Two minutes from now. Okay. Uh, are you smoking? A lot. I love smoking. Okay. Uh, how many sticks per day? About 10 sticks per day. Uh, for how long? 10 years. Okay. I would like to uh, advise you to stop smoking. Uh, I would refer you to uh, Stop Smoking Clinic. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, uh, do you drink alcohol? No. Okay, uh, what's your occupation? I'm working as a businessman. Okay, do you uh, travel? A lot. Okay, uh, where's your recent traveling? It was to United States of America. Okay, anywhere else? No. Uh, do you uh, do you stay in the uh, creek, uh, hotel or uh, just a normal place? I was staying in a five star hotel. Okay, all right. Okay, can I examine you? Of course, why not? Okay, uh, first I want to look at your eyes to see any pallor. There is no pallor. Okay, any rashes over the body? No rashes on the body. Okay, I'll uh, check. I would like to check the abdomen. Uh, any tenderness? So you are exposing the tummy. You are palpating the tummy, doing the deep palpation in a S fashion. You are checking. You are checking. You are checking. 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 There is no tenderness. Any mess? No mess. Okay. Um. Any concern? Uh, Mr. Najib is up. Okay.
Okay, so can you please list down your differentials? Uh, for this case, uh, my first uh, differential diagnosis uh, would be possibility of an uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, second differential is autonomic uh, diarrhea related to the uncontrolled uh, diabetes. Mm -hmm. And the third uh, differential is um, viral, viral AGE. Oh, I know. Okay, sorry, sorry, Jardiasis. Jardiasis. Jardiasis, okay. So how will you thoroughly investigate your case? Okay. Uh, to investigate, uh, first, uh, go for, I will go for a full blood count, full blood picture, a full blood count to look for a uh, HB level and total white, ESR, CRP, uh, mm -hmm. the stool uh, culture, stool uh, examinations, then uh, celiac uh, serology, and also uh, diabetes uh, HbA1c to check for the control of diabetes. Then um, I, I would also uh, go for um, the, uh, the OGDS uh, and also the biopsy of the what, small- what, what you have mentioning before the biopsy? Uh, OGD, OGDS for uh, to get the biopsy. Okay. Try to avoid abbreviations in your PACES exam. All right. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Okay. Um, what are you suspecting in the biopsy and where exactly from where do you want to take the biopsy? Uh, from the uh, we like to take from the uh, second part of the duodenum to uh, if there's a uh, celiac disease, then... Okay, um, say for example, if uh, how will you know that the celiac disease is absent? Sorry, the celiac disease is sleeping or it's active. How will you differentiate on the biopsy? There's a vigorous atrophy. Okay, so you mean to say that if villus atrophy is absent, it means that the celiac disease is still sleeping. There, there's uh, um, inflammatory inflammation uh, going on if uh, okay. active. Then uh, I would also, uh, because my first differential was IBD, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, I would also subject the patient to colonoscopy and biopsy. Okay, will you do colonoscopy first or the upper GI endoscopy first in this patient? According to your history and examination. Uh, colonoscopy first. Okay. Okay. So say for example, if colonoscopy as well as um, endoscopy came out to be absolutely normal. Yeah. Then, um. I'll go for a uh, celiac serology, PSH. Celiac serology will be positive as a patient is already yeah. having celiac disease. Okay, so how will you manage this patient thoroughly? To manage uh, this patient, uh, my first uh, differential is uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, I would uh, start steroid therapy. And also uh, depends on the severity. And also, uh, my, Mesalazine. Okay, so let's uh, let's do this case again and let's discuss this case and uh, to learn some approach how to approach this case. Okay. Okay. So first of all, uh, we have been provided with the information that the Mr. Navid is quite a young person having celiac disease as well as type one DM. Type one DM presented with the loosening, worsening of the loose motions and the dizziness and having no appropriate findings in the stool BR, but they're having HbA1c of 8.8. .8. So with this information, we have to make our mind. We have to think out of the box. We have to have some road map how to approach this case because station five is a pressurized station in which you will feel that you are working inside a pressure cooker because you are fighting against the time. You have very less time. 
even few wrong questions or unnecessary questions can kill your considerable time. So we have to make the mind. We have been provided with two, three important things, three important things, dizziness, DM, select disease, select disease, DM, dizziness, and with a background of worsening of the loose motions. So we have to gather our mind. We have to make the mind like how we will approach this case. Celiac disease with type 1 DM is a significant history in this patient. So before I uh, explain to you uh, how to approach this case, let's discuss your differential first. Your first differential was IBD. Which sort of IBD you are thinking about? Ulcerative colitis or uh, Crohn's disease? Um, ulcerative colitis. Do you believe that the ulcerative colitis will present without severe tummy pain, fevers, and bleeding PR? Yeah, no. We are not getting a single episode of blood in the loose motions with the fevers, with the tummy pains. It means that something else is going on there especially if you are suspecting that this is IBD, you should ask me about the extra intestinal manifestation of the IBD. Uveitis, low backache for sacroiliitis, joint pains, break in the skin for pyoderma gangrenosum. So we have to ask. And also oral ulcers for Crohn's disease. If we want to make a differential of IBD, it requires us to have a very thorough knowledge of IBD, especially about the manifestations, that is the extra intestinal manifestations. If we are talking about the intestinal manifestations, they are usually in the ulcerative colitis, bleeding PR with loose motion, bleeding PR with loose motions, plus fever, plus tummy pain, plus weight loss, plus anemia, plus manifestations of anemia. If we are thinking about ulcerative colitis, we will think about sacroiliitis as well as uveitis and pyoderma gangrenosum. If we are getting the scenario, we will be confident enough to make the differential of IBD, that is ulcerative colitis. But unfortunately, we are not getting anything in this case. Am I right? Yeah. Good. Now, going ahead with the Crohn's disease. In the Crohn's disease, we should at least have some episodes of the loose motions. But this patient is stating to us that I am having loose motion and they are continuing for the last three months with no fever, with no tummy pains. Again, the diagnosis of Crohn's is in question. Secondly, we are not getting, we are not getting any oral ulcers, any extra intestinal manifestations of the IBD. So again, our diagnosis of IBD will be in question. If we are attributing this dizziness towards anemia, anemia secondary to IBD, this is highly, highly less likely. Why? Because the patient is not giving us the history of bleeding PR. Mm -hmm. Patient is not anemic on examination. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. So, we should give the differentials based on the evidence. Now, what was your second differential? Uh, autonomic. Autonomic oh. dysfunction uh, related to the DM. It can be one of the differential, but if we are thinking, if we are thinking about this case thoroughly, uh, the patient is giving you the diagnosis, telling you the diagnosis of DM, that I am having type 1 DM for the last one year, one year, one year. 
with no complication of the DM, no numbness, no tingling, no heart attacks, no stroke, no water problems. It means that DM is not a culprit over here. Yeah, if he is telling us that I am having DM for the last 10 years, I will surely think about it. Okay. Now, going ahead, what was your third differential? That is Jardiasis. Yes. So, in the Jardiasis, we should have some evidence also, like Steatoria. Steatoria is a very characteristic finding in Jardiasis. The stools are quite fatty. They are difficult to flush. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the guy is telling to you that I am staying in a five-star hotel, not on the lakes, not in the caves, not doing the camping. Again, a differential of Jardiosis is in question. Even if there is some hidden history, which you are not asking me, okay, you are staying in a five-star hotel, any leisure activities over there? Were you going any there or like visiting or doing the camping there? You're not asking me. Even if he is doing the camping, but there's no, no, no steatoria. No fatty, bulky, false smelling, loose motions. It will be very difficult for me to put a differential of jardiosis in this case. Okay? Okay. Now let's explore this case. What went wrong in this case? Why, why we were having the difficulty to reach a diagnosis in this case? A very typical case, the very good case. We are sitting outside from the examination hall. We, we have not even, you know, touched the patient or, you know, uh, communicating with the patient, examining the patient. Mm -hmm. We have been provided with the information, the celiac disease and the type one DM. It means that some autoimmune phenomena is going on there. Defense system, defense system is misdirected. Something is wrong with the immune system. Mm. Okay, that's a good thing to think about refractory celiac disease. It's a good thing to think about um, non-compliance with the wheat products. It's a good thing to think about autonomic uh, diabetic uh, uh, autonomic uh, dysfunction. It's a good thing. But you are supposed to think about some autoimmune phenomena over there. Celiac mm -hmm. disease with a type 1 DM. What's wrong with this patient? Okay, it can be one thing that patient can be the type 1 DM. The patient is having celiac disease, but he is having two autoimmune phenomena going on there. It means something is wrong. Something is fishy over there. Now, reading ahead, having worsening of the loose motion with the dizziness, 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 dizziness. Mm -hmm. And you are not touching the history of the dizziness in your station five. Yeah, I missed that. Yes exactly when the patient is having dizziness. What exactly he means by dizziness? Then, when, when it is occurring, how it is getting improved, how it is getting worse. My patient is telling to me that, doctor, whenever I'm standing from the sitting position, I am having dizziness. Now, can you change your differentials? Yar, yar, yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Six zero five. Na, check karne aaye the deep ke log. So, everybody should mute your mic, please. It's causing a distortion during the course, during the session. You should keep your mic muted. Dr. New, please unmute your mic uh, and unmute yourself again. Hello. Okay. 
Okay, there was some distortion from somebody's mic, so I have to mute. Everybody should keep the mic muted. It is the humble request, please. Okay, I'm coming back. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. So, some autoimmune phenomena is going on there. Mm -hmm. With the dizziness, patient is having the dizziness on standing from the sitting posture. Now, with this information, dizziness from standing, uh, okay, sorry, standing from the sitting posture, it can be multiple things going on there. I am fully agreeing with you that it can be anemia. It can be autonomic dysfunction. It can be something else. But think about anemia in this patient. Anemia, anemia of the chronic disease, okay, I can agree. It can be the possibility. But again, he's saying to you that nobody is telling me that I'm getting paler than before. You should ask about the anemia. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you are checking the anemia in the conjunctiva, the anemia is absent. Then, autonomic dysfunction. Okay, we can think about it, but again, if you are attributing this autonomic dysfunction towards DM, it is a dangerous task. Why? Because examiners will ask you. Patient is having DM just for the last one year. Only for the last one year he is having DM. Do you think that the one year is enough for the DM to cause all the destructions? So, Again, think with me, Dr. Neo. Again, let's explore this scenario again. Mm. Let's learn something, like how to approach diagnosis. But what went wrong? Because if we are not learning from the mistakes, it will be very difficult to catch the diagnosis in the real exam. Mm. Focus on this slide. Young male, salic, DM, dizziness with the loose motions. If I'm convinced that this is some autonomic dysfunction, I must think of an other autoimmune phenomena going on there. Mm -hmm. With the loose motion, it is our classical teaching to rule out Edison disease. Addison disease, Addison disease. And the dizziness was pointing towards Addison. Mm -hmm. Now, I can show you the picture of the patient that he is having the dark color skin, but deliberately I'm not showing you over there. Why? Because if you are appearing in the exam, say for example, in the Kenya or in the India, Pakistan, in our centers, Usually, the skin tone is a bit darker. Mm -hmm. To see the patient from the face, you will not be able to recognize that this patient is having Addison or not. Until you are checking the palms, mm -hmm. especially creases. Until you are examining the oral cavity. And with my experience of teaching, candidates are mostly forgetting to check the oral cavity. My experience is telling that in the oral cavity, there is findings. If not 100% cases, at least in 60% of the cases in the cases, please, 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 I request you don't forget to think once, think once about the oral cavity in your PACES exam. Because it is closed, it's not in front of us. So we are forgetting it. Hands are in front of us, we are checking. Faces in front of us, we are checking. Tummy is in front of us, we are checking, but we are not managing to open the patient mouth. So a clue, or you can say a tip for you that in your places exam, don't forget the oral cavity. Okay? Regarding the skin tone, it is very difficult to ascertain that this patient is having Addison because a lot of patients are having dark color skin. So this was the case of Addison disease. What was the clue? 
the clue was autoimmune phenomena celiac disease type 1 dm with the dizziness with the dizziness with the dizziness now this is not just a uh, edison disease it is polyglandular syndrome type 2 because we are dealing with multiple autoimmune phenomena over there it is not going towards type 1 why because we are not having mucocutaneous candidiasis mm. type 1 polyglandular syndrome and type 2 are overlapping lot of times the main differentiating point which i usually teach to my students is please think about mucocutaneous candidiasis if it is present this is type 1 if it is absent think about type 2 dm with celiac with addison i will give the differential of type 2 autoimmune polyglandular syndrome again to teach you why you are missing the diagnosis because you are not correlating the things celiac disease with type 1 dm loose motions with a background of dizziness think about addison now of course for the investigations you have to investigate the patient very thoroughly your history will tell you whether the patient is having non compliance for the celiac disease non compliance for diet or the patient is having some autoimmune dysfunction because of type 1 dm or having some other phenomena going on so in this patient we have to do all the tests to diagnose this condition and also to refute our other differentials of course cbc to look for an infective etiology anemia ESR CRP again the inflammatory markers if you are thinking about IBD then of course to do your in depth to look for ora ova cyst parasites and also serum cortisol dexamethasone test and i will like to go for type 1 dm workup of course urine for microalbuminuria i will like to go for fasting lipid profile i will like to go for thorough examination with a type 1 peripheral neuropathy if i am thinking about autonomic dysfunction of course if peripheral neuropathy is start developing i will surely think of autoimmune dysfunction but the patient is not giving me the history of any numbness tingling in the hands and the feet yeah. again for the celiac i have to look into the matter and also the refractive celiac can be in my differential and for that i have to go for uh, biopsy in the management again the management is a bit tricky over there why because you have to take on board the multiple specialties in this case i will take on board gastroenterologist endocrinologist why endocrinologist because i am dealing with addison as well as type 1 dm mm -hmm. of course for the addison i have to uh, start the patient on steroids again don't forget about the bracelet medicular blessed bracelet then strict control of type 1 dm because the patient is having hba1c of 8.8 and the celiac by taking on board dietitian one thing is again tricky over there the patient is having dizziness on standing from the sitting posture so i will never forget i will never forget about the risk to fall if i am not addressing this risk i will lose my mass in patient welfare okay uh, okay 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 Doctor Neo, do you have any questions? And uh, no. Okay. If anybody wants to ask me any questions, use the raise hand option. Doctor Shahin, do you want to ask anything? Doctor Chetan, please unmute yourself. 
Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, Wa In this case, we will address driving for dizziness or not. Of course, you have to. But again, this is on the standing and the patient is doing the driving on the sitting, sitting posture. If anything is not mentioned in the DVLA, you will not stop the driving. Sometimes you are stopping the driving and the, patient, and the examiner is cutting your marks in patient welfare. It has happened to some candidates in the real exam. If something is not mentioned in the DVLA, you will not stop the driving. So, sir, in Certainly, this case... Yes, yes, I'm telling you, I'm coming towards that point. If the patient is aware of the signs and the symptoms of hypoglycemia or the type 1 DM, it's okay. Secondly, if there is no episode of hypoglycemia, more than one episode, sorry, sorry, sorry. If there is no more than one episode of the hypoglycemia in the last one year, patient can continue driving. Yes, Dr. Chetan, please unmute your mic. Yes, it's unmuted. Hello, uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, so what is the cause for loose stool in this patient? Addison disease. Addison itself? Yes, a very well-known cause of the loose motions. Okay. Any ambiguity? No, sir, no. no. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Anybody wants to ask any question? Dr. Saloma, please unmute your mic. Hello, sir. Uh, yeah. In the history station, uh, if the patient is telling us that uh, he is uh, not controlling his diabetes, uh, do we have to uh, tell him a few uh, words about uh, the importance of the controlling of diabetes or uh, talk about uh, that hemoglobin A1C should be uh, like that, like yeah, less than uh, seven or in the history, this is communication, no need for in the history station. So we were doing actually the station five. In the station five, you don't have the time and it will be enough for you to state your examiner that I want to do the patient counseling and education. But in the station two, you are supposed to tell at least the symptoms of the hypoglycemia. And also to educate the patient that sir, it is quite important for you to manage your blood sugars because you may end up in the complications. And in this regard, I will take on board our specialist diabetes doctor and also the dietitian to help you to guide regarding the uh, uh, diet matters, how to avoid the sugary foods and how to avoid the fatty meals without making your meal undelicious. In this way, you have to counsel. And secondly, of course, if the scenario is of the DM, in the station four, you have to do the complete thorough counseling. And I think we have already discussed it a lot of time before. If uh, you have any ambiguity, you can again ask me, no problem. Dr. Moten, please unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon, doctor. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to ask about uh, the new station five. Uh, as you know, uh, it will be uh, about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, uh, did you know, sir, uh, when? Still, uh, it is, uh, 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 still there are no recent guidelines and no recent notification about uh, from the RCP. And it has not been included uh, in the upcoming diets. So whenever they are including it, they will inform well before the time. It was scheduled to be started in 2020, but because of the COVID thing, and of course, a lot of candidates are not getting a slot. So RCP has still, you know, delayed the plan to implement that system for now at least. Okay, doctor, thank you very much. Okay, welcome. Dr. Murad, please unmute yourself. Uh, just I want to make sure we need to admit the patient, right? Since he has Addison and dizziness and his blood pressure is borderline. No, I will not admit the patient. 
So I will you... thoroughly investigate the patient on the mm -hmm. OPT basis. I will try to uh, diagnose the patient and call for the follow-up. Why? Because there is no need, no need currently for that mission. Uh, okay, so even we can start steroid, we can of take course. time to start steroid later on. It, it should of not course. be immediately. Patient has to be given steroids on the OPD basis. Okay, so is there any time when we have to admit Addison? Addison in uh, crisis. Other than, yeah, other than Addison crisis. Yes, like I'm of on course. Addison if, if, if the patient condition is warranting the admission, like the patient is vitally unstable, okay. any risk of the deterioration in the immediate future, any warning signs, any red flags, okay, you have sure. to admit the patient. Okay, thank you so much. Welcome. Okay, so we are starting our next station that is Dr. Slakshna. Are you over here? Please unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So are you ready for your station? Yes. Okay. Please take your time. This is important scenario. I'm sharing my screen for you. Make your notes and we'll start, okay? Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Dr. Slakshina, are you ready? Just, just a minute, sir. Okay. Just a minute, sir. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir, I'm getting. Okay. I'm giving you timer and I will prompt you at 12th minute, okay? So you have yes. uh, 14 minutes with your patient. Okay, yes. your time starts now. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Selakshna, I'm the doctor for the clinic. Uh, may I confirm your name? Is it Mr. Nassim? Yes, I am Mr. Nassim. And are you 34 years old? Yes, I am. Mr. Nassim, uh, we are here to uh, speak about the incident that has just happened. Uh, is it all right? Yes, of course. And uh, do you want anybody else to be present during this time? Just explain to me, doctor. I am in a bit stressful state. I'm devastated. I feel I want to commit the suicide. I can't live with this HIV thing. I, I have got your... a needle stick injury from a patient who was HIV positive. I'm having mm -hmm. palpitations because of this incident. Please help me. 
i appreciate your concern mr nasim and we are here to help you out and we'll surely uh, i'll answer all your questions and we'll find a way out uh, from this uh, can you tell me more about the uh, needle stick injury that you had yes i was basically drawing a blood from the vein of uh, a person who is having the hiv not just the hiv but other aids so i was drawing a blood and suddenly i don't know what has happened that instead of putting back this needle under the cap sorry inside the cap i just uh, you know injured my finger mm -hmm. uh, may i ask were you uh, wearing precautionary uh, gloves yes okay and uh, how much time before uh, like now how much time has lapsed in between i think half an hour okay that is nice you came immediately to us and uh, may i know uh, uh, how deep was the injury mm, i can't tell you exactly but might be few millimeters it was piercing my skin okay and did you lose any blood from there yes okay and how much would that be might be drop or two oh, all right and uh, did you do any first aid in the ward when this happened mm, i don't know what exactly come under the heading of the first aid according to you i don't know what you want to ask uh, did you wash your hand yes okay and uh, did you squeeze the finger yes all right uh, well uh, then uh, uh, did you apply any antiseptic over it yes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay well uh, mr nasim uh, let us uh, i would tell you what we would do uh, for the mm -hmm. and uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll take a baseline uh, test from you uh, immediately now and mm -hmm. uh, we would send some investigation that is uh, one is for the hiv and also we'll get uh, the hepatitis b and for the hepatitis c uh, baseline for you okay would it be all right i'm Are not you getting you literally i'm not getting you why do you want to check my hepatitis Uh, well, Mr. I have uh, got a needle stick injury from a HIV positive patient. It is making sense for me that you are checking my HIV status. And secondly, I don't believe that it will get positive within minutes. Second concern is that why you are not checking the hepatitis status of that patient? Why me? Well, Mr. Nasim, I am here to explain it to you, and I appreciate all your concerns. Uh, the thing is, we need a baseline HIV. I I know you being into medical field, it is not going to be positive immediately in minutes or hours, but we need to know the baseline of uh, status of your health, and that also includes other viral viruses that can be in uh, contracted by the needle stick injury. but by doing but this, my question is like what benefit will it give to you like you are checking today right now yes so what would happen is uh, once we do that it would be uh, uh, you would be able to have a uh, compensation uh, about if at all if furthermore you have any disease related uh, to any of these viruses uh, which are there so we would be able to treat you and uh, we would be able to prove that you are not previously positive with this and you would get some occupational benefits uh, with it okay uh, mm -hmm. this is making sense for me but i have a concern this is a good mm -hmm. thing that you are checking my best baseline status of hiv hepatitis b and c but what i what i i'm thinking that of course it will be beneficial in uh, some compensation matters but i will be under stress like if the patient was hepatitis b and c positive i will become positive 
I think after a couple of we couple of months, why not you are checking the hepatitis B and C status of that patient along with mine status? Uh, well, the patient that uh, we have, uh, if the patient needs and the treatment protocol says that we need to check him for the other viruses also, we would surely check him for that. Then check it for but me now. now. As of now, we need to uh, check you because uh, we need to be uh, assured and as uh, you are worried that it would spread to you and that is why we are checking you. Uh, the spread rate is uh, very, very minimal, Mr. Nasim, mm -hmm. and uh, it is uh, only for HIV, it is only 0.3% that the uh, virus can transmit to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is a very rare chance. And uh, even if it is a very rare chance, we don't want to take a chance. And we want to give you the best of the treatment that is available. And uh, at the earliest, if at all something happens, mm -hmm. along with all the compensation, so that mm -hmm. is why we need to focus more on you uh, about uh, this incident that has happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Am I making sense, Mr. Nasir? You are not making sense today. If the patient is hepatitis B or C positive, I will become positive after a couple of months. At least tell me, check the state of the patient right now so that I get stress-free that that patient is not having hepatitis B and C also. Okay. Uh, uh, well, Talk Mr. to Nasim, your consultant about that. Uh, well, Mr. Nasim, uh, as it is rightly mentioned that you would be stressed about it, but we are here to help you. And this test that we are doing, we would be repeating this test regularly, say after three and six months. And uh, we would be uh, so telling I have, the or You mean to say that I should wait? You mean to say that I should wait for a couple of months to see whether I am getting positive or not? And till then, till then, or for the couple of months, I should be on the verge of a death that might be I'm getting positive. At least, at least give me a surety that the patient is not hepatitis B and C positive. Check the state of the patient right now for me, please. Talk to your consultant about that. Well, Mr. Nasim, I appreciate your concern. And uh, because it is a communicable disease and it is, uh, we need to have uh, consent from the patient regarding this. And uh, that is why it is uh, difficult to uh, focus on the patient at present. And uh, we need to focus on you. And uh, that is why uh, we would suggest that uh, we would uh, take the test now. And also, okay, uh, furthermore... Actually, Dr. Slakshna, you are unable to meet this concern. Please go ahead because okay. we are taking more time. I will teach you how to answer this concern. Go ahead. Okay, also, uh, because after we have taken your blood samples, uh, we would be giving you uh, uh, something known as PEP, uh, that is a post-exposure prophylaxis. This is a medication that we give so that even if there is a very slightest of the chance that uh, you are being infected, uh, the, uh, the chances of you getting a full-blown disease would be very mm -hmm. less. Okay. Means to say that if still I am not getting positive because you are telling to me that the chance is just 0.3%, still you will give me that peep, right? Yes, yes. It is advisable okay. to be taking the uh, post-exposure prophylaxis for it. Okay. And we would be continuing that prophylaxis for around 28 days and uh, with a regular follow-up. And mm -hmm. uh, if uh, uh, you have not completed the hepatitis B vaccination process, uh, we would suggest that uh, you come you start with the process immediately Is okay it all right? i have never taken any hepatitis b shot before mm -hmm. okay and uh, then we would uh, proceed with the hepatitis b vaccination prof uh, procedure and uh, we would see to it that uh, you complete the process in uh, it would complete in around six months 
Uh, there will but be what I believe is that it will make it will make my immunity later on in the later months. Right now, anything else which you will do for me to make me safe from the patient that is hepatitis B positive, any other way? Pardon, I didn't get you. I'm sorry. I mean to say that what personally I believe from my medical knowledge, as I'm a staff nurse that this hepatitis B vaccination takes some months to play his roles. So before that, if the patient is hepatitis B positive right now, which you're not checking, and I have been inoculated with the hepatitis B, can you do something for me right now? Uh, the post uh, exposure prophylaxis that we would be giving you, uh, it would also cover for the hepatitis B. So uh, be rest assured uh, that uh, we are covering you even for that. And uh, along with that, we would be giving you vaccination. Okay. okay. Uh, may I ask some uh, personal questions, please? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, whom do you live with? I'm living with my wife. Okay. And uh, have you uh, completed your family? No. Okay. But I would suggest that uh, in this time, at least for three months, uh, you should, uh, you, uh, we suggest that you use a barrier method for uh, intimate relationships and uh, avoid any kind of pregnancy. Okay. And uh, also, uh, we sh you should avoid any blood donation at present. Mm -hmm. And uh, any, uh, be, you should be careful about any sharp objects or any needles in the further uh, recent times. Okay. okay. And, uh, <clears throat> okay. And uh, as I said, uh, there is one more thing that I would uh, want to discuss with you, and that is regarding the incident report, uh, because uh, this has happened on uh, in the hospital premises, and uh, there would be an incident report written regarding it, and how it has happened, and uh, the precautions that you took, as well as the uh, post-exposure uh, treatment that you have received, and the investigations we have sent. Okay. Okay, and uh, uh, even if and the hospital authorities would be uh, informed regarding this, and uh, because of this, we would, uh, for at least uh, six months, we would be uh, giving you a, a, a job profile in which uh, you don't have to be in close contact with the patient or any of the... But I have um, a passion to be a staff nurse. Or you can stop me from dealing with the patients. It's I not being equal you. rights of a person. I, I, I I'm not. I am not HIV positive still now. You are. You can't say that. We call it to urine narration that the chances are just 0.3%. And on the basis of that 0.3%, you are refraining me from dealing with the patient. Well, I appreciate your concern and uh, the Occupational Health and the Infectious Disease Department would, uh, uh, would, up, uh, would be counseling you regarding this. And uh, it is only after uh, confirmation from them you can go back to uh, in-person contact, uh, in contact with the patients. Uh, other than that, you can be accommodated uh, from the Occupational Health in uh, things that are... Uh, into a clerical job or maybe a desk job. It, it is only for a few months and uh, it would, uh, once they have cleared, you can join back as the uh, staff okay. nurse that you were working as. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, do you have any other concerns, Mr. Nasim? No concerns for now. Okay. Uh, so we have discussed uh, regarding uh, your uh, injury and uh, the investigations we would be sending also the post-exposure prophylaxis and the incident report and uh, informing the hospital authorities regarding the shift of job. Uh, is there any other concern regarding this? No concerns for you. Okay. Uh, do we have to... Um, 
okay uh, i would give you some uh, invest uh, this um, websites and brochures regarding the uh, post exposure prophylaxis if you have any fever rash uh, you should immediately seek uh, medical attention uh, okay. if the medication causes anything is it all the right? time yes. is up okay okay so uh can you please uh, tell me like how you will follow the patient of the needle stick injury in the future like uh, how you will investigate this patient in the future investigate wise uh, the patient could be investigated uh, at, at the time of injury and uh, every 3 months that is at third and sixth month we would be sending the uh, hiv status as well as uh, hbs ag and hcv and hc for the patient again repeat this is very important aspect of this station again repeat uh, uh, follow would, protocol of the needle stick injury uh we would immediately get the test done and uh, post that it would be at the third month and as the at the sixth month okay so uh don't you think that you should tell about the side effects of the peep yeah, it came to its last okay so uh what are the legal issues in this case uh legal issue is the uh, consent for the hiv testing mm -hmm. uh, it is also about the confidentiality uh, about the mm -hmm. patient uh, we can't um about the patient and the uh, okay will you break nurse. the confidentiality over here or not uh about the patient or uh, the staff nurse of course i'm talking about the staff nurse yes. the subject so, yes it, it is uh, i have to uh inform the authorities because the occupation of the patient uh, can cause spread of okay. the will, uh, uh, will you inform the authorities or the staff nurse will inform the authorities mm -hmm. okay and i'm not so, sure about that. okay i am telling i will tell you so uh, tell me one thing uh, why why you not checking the hiv sorry hepatitis b and c status of this patient like the patient from which he has got needle stick injury uh because, because it is uh, an easy way why because it's a easy way you can check it now and uh, he will be stress free and also the patient will get the benefit whether he is hiv uh, sorry hepatitis b and c positive or not why are not checking the status of patient um, it is uh, it as it is also a communicable disease and uh, once if i come to know about the status of the patient whether it is positive or negative it would also lead to a confidentiality issue regarding the patient so should i do you think that it, it will mm -hmm. should i be mm -hmm. disclosing it to the male matlab the staff nurse who the mr nasim who is at, who was attending so it is like a breach of confidentiality plus okay. uh, the But patient should be uh, patient should be given a consent patient should give a consent regarding this got so got we don't good. know whether the patient will give a consent or not okay what is the beneficence in this case uh, beneficence is doing good to the uh, Uh, to the staff nurse or the patient uh, by giving uh, him uh, uh, by investigating him right away and as well as keeping a follow up of investigation plus mm -hmm. giving him a post exposure prophylaxis mm -hmm. and also uh, telling him to have a uh, practice safe intimate relationship so that uh, okay. there is no pregnancy and no chance of spreading okay, it okay say for person. example he is not hiv positive right now okay he is not hiv positive on the baseline he is hiv negative and today he got an needle stick injury from the mm -hmm. hiv positive patient so he is not telling his wife will you break the confidentiality or wait for him to get positive results mm -hmm. to tell the wife as of now today 
yes yes no i i will not break the confidentiality uh, i i would advise him to uh, practice safe sex and he is not practicing he is not practicing the safe sex he is not using the barrier method and today after getting a needle stick injury from a hiv positive patient he is still negative today's test is negative and you are advising him as there are 0.3% chances please avoid going for uh, uh, please go for the uh, barrier method and he is not ready to use the barrier methods so will you break the confidentiality or not Oh, I would explain it to him that the spouse can catch the infection. He is not understanding you. He is not understanding you. I would uh, still not break the confidentiality, okay. and in this regarding regard, I would take the help of. Uh, if at all he turns out positive, I'll take a help of uh, the legal team from the hospital. Okay, so uh, let's. Uh, so you finished, right? Uh, yes. Sir. Okay. so uh, let's do this case let's discuss it uh, about its legalities and also about how to do this case overall you have done well uh, but there are some mistakes and we have to rectify it to perform this scenario very well because this is one of the very important case uh, and of course this is also a daily life scenarios in your hospitals so first of all when the patient is coming to you with a needle stick injury having the needle stick injury from a hiv positive patient first step first step first step forget about the wearing gloves forget about the blood oozing forget about the needle thing just first step palm the patient and just now you were stating that the patient is in the apprehensive state first relax him let him sit over there offer him a tissue paper and a glass of water say to him that sir i am over here with all sort of help and support and i will see how i can help you in this regard but let me say you one thing still we have not discussed your issue but let me tell you one thing even before starting counseling you to so relax you sir there is just 0.3% chance of getting hiv from the needle stick injury from the hiv positive patient you still have 99.7% chances of not getting of not getting hiv okay yes sir secondly there are lot of factors which are attributing towards this risk let's discuss this if you are calm if you allow me we can discuss okay doctor go ahead so sir i want to ask you exactly what you were doing at that time you are asking me i was replying you that's good then you were wearing the gloves yes how many gloves first mistake how many gloves because the number of gloves matters one glove or two gloves then second mistake depth of piercing the need, uh, the skin it's good but ask about the bore of the needle bore of the needle bore of the needle bore of the needle i the cannula of 22 numbers 22 gauge is much smaller than the cannula having the gauge of 16 numbers it matters why because the large pore cannula will be containing much blood more amount of the blood which will be inoculated in the patient's finger bore of the needle second mistake then are you washing your hands after that yes doctor i was washing with which thing plain waters or a soap water lot of difference because the soap is disinfectant then of course you are asking me about just a second
sorry, I'm back. So you have to ask about like whether he is squeezing the finger, squeezing a blood out of the finger or not. Going ahead, then with which thing he is disinfecting the finger. After that, you will say to him that still, still sir, there are less chances, but of course there are chances. Don't worry, we are with your side to help you in all these matters and to guide you about its future implications. Unfortunately, there are some blood-borne diseases with the needle stick injury. There are some risks, some risks, some risks of getting hepatitis B and C also with the needle stick injury. Stop. Pass. Because now you will listen the concerns. Now patient will be again apprehensive. The patient will start questioning. These are the concerns by your RCP. Listen to them calmly. It is not absolutely required by you to answer all that concerns at that point, but you have to answer. You can answer them as you are doing your scenario step in a stepwise approach. You can say, sir, I'm surely explaining to you. And after a few minutes, I will be in a more better place to answer all your concerns. Okay, okay. Now let's start from the HIV, sir. Today, what we are doing is that we are getting a baseline test of hepatitis B, C, and HIV. Because if you are not getting these infections today, but unfortunately, if you are getting them after a couple of weeks, after a couple of months, we can attribute these infections towards that needle stick injury, which you have got today. And it will help us to claim compensation. But of course, if he is positive today, it will be very difficult for us to differentiate whether he is getting, like he's, he was already, uh, you know, already um, having hepatitis B, C, and HIV. So he will not get the compensation. Secondly, regarding the HIV, I will immediately start the PEEP post-exposure prophylaxis of the HIV medications. Even though the chances are very, very less, but still we will not take a chance. If we are starting a PEEP within 72 hours, sir, it will reduce the chances even, even less than 0.3. These are the good medications. Without these medications, the chances are 0.3%. But if you are taking these medications, the chances will be more rare then. Are you ready to take these medications? Yes. For how long you have to take? One month. Then tell about the side effects of the PEEP. Sometimes pancreatitis, nausea, vomiting, tummy pains, sometimes uh, yellow discoloration of the eyes, and lipodystrophy. Explain, but in very short, very short narration, just in 10 or 15 seconds, because this scenario is quite long. Then we will check your status, your status of uh, HIV after three months of completing PEEP and after, or, and at six months. Now regarding hepatitis C, again, we are checking the baseline status of hepatitis C. Again, checking it at the one month, three months, and the six months. Unfortunately, if you are getting positive for it, don't worry. We have very good medications for the treatment of hepatitis C, which are having the cure rate of nearly 100%. But unfortunately, we are not having any post-exposure prophylaxis of hepatitis C. 
regarding hepatitis b here you can ask one thing sir have you been vaccinated before for hepatitis b or not if he is vaccinated if he is vaccinated you will check the titer of anti hbs and if the titer is good you will just give a booster otherwise if the titer is not not adequate you will go ahead with the passive immunization with the booster if the titer is not adequate you will give the passive immunization with the booster and if he is never been vaccinated before for hepatitis b you will do two things number one passive immunization number two active immunization and his concern was very valid in the scenario that these active vaccination will help me after a couple of months right now if i am getting hepatitis b what you are doing for me we are giving you preformed antibodies to neutralize to neutralize if by chance you are getting hepatitis b from this patient again repeating if titer is in a good uh, you know uh, in a recommended uh, uh, level that is more than 100 you have to do nothing and some authorities say you can give the booster if the titer is less less than 10 you have to do you have to give the booster as well as you have to do the passive immunization by the antibodies third situation if he never been vaccinated before for hepatitis b you have to start active immunization from today and give passive immunization that is antibodies from today and of course you will follow like hepatitis b in this patient too now again you have to come to him even though you are not positive for the hepatitis b c or hiv but still you have to refrain because the chances are there to get infected to get infected and you have to do protective intercourse use the barrier method avoid dealing with the patient and in this regard you have to inform the hr department hospital authorities they will assign you some desk job or some other clerical work he will inform he will inform if he is saying to you that i will not inform the authorities then you will break the confidentiality but first you have to say him that you have to inform second issue dr slakshna was struggling during this scenario that whether he should in whether whether we should inform his wife or not in case right now his hiv hepatitis b hepatitis c came out to be negative at the baseline but he has got needle stick injury he is not ready to tell the wife he is not ready to use the barrier method even though he is negative he is right now negative but chances are there for hiv 0.3% for hepatitis b 33% for hepatitis c 3% we have to break the bad uh, we have to break the confidentiality to the wife so that he should use the barrier method again a problem in this scenario that dr slakshna was fe uh, facing that he was uh, asking about why you are not going for the test of the patient you can test for the patient so that i should at least get calm whether i am getting the infection or not no we will not check we will not check the status of the hepatitis b and c or hiv in the patient hiv was already known but we will not check the hepatitis b and c status of the patient why again the same reason without any indication 
we are not checking the status of the patient. If the patient is having some indication, of course, we will check. We will not check just because this guy had got the needle stick injury from the patient so that we should know whether this patient was hepatitis B and C positive or not. We will not check. Secondly, the confidentiality issue, because if we are checking, of course, he will ask us like whether he was hepatitis B or C positive or not. We cannot break the confidentiality of the third party. Of course, you have to counsel this patient to attend uh, the occupational counseling from the occupational health physician to get a relocated. And if everything came out to be negative, then of course, uh, he can resume dealing with the patients. Of course, he must not donate also the blood during this period. In the end, you have to, uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 provide him with the brochures, leaflets, and some web addresses about the needle stick injury of the NHS. You have to provide him more information about the, in the written form of the needle stick injury, and you have to calm him. And if he is still apprehensive, you can involve the mood doctor and the mood nurse. This is the way to, uh, this is the way to do the scenario. So I got a question. There is no, there is no post exposure prophylaxis of hepatitis C. If the patient had got unfortunately hepatitis B from needle stick injury, we cannot provide any PEEP for the hepatitis C, for the hepatitis C. We have to wait for his zero conversion. And once he is being positive for the hepatitis C, the chances are just 3%. We'll start DAAs, direct acting antiviral agents. Another question. If we don't check the hepatitis B status of the patient, how can we give hepatitis B prophylaxis to the patient with needle stick injury? We will never, 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 never check the status of hepatitis B of the patient, the patient from whom he had got the needle stick injury. But to this staff nurse, we will check anti HBS titer. If it is in an adequate uh, you know, uh, levels that is more than 100, nothing to do. Or some authorities suggest still the booster. If it is not in the recommended uh, levels, it is low, less than 10, we have to give the booster along with giving passive immunization, that is antibodies. If he has never been immunized for the hepatitis B before, that is the, our staff nurse, we have to start both active as well as passive. Okay, any other questions? Like use the raise hand option if, any, if anybody wants to ask the question. I'm getting a lot of questions in the Zoom chat box. So you can also ask by using the raise hand option. Viral load for patient, do we check in HIV? No. We will not check. We have been provided with information that the patient is HIV positive. Whether the viral load is nil or not nil, the protocol is same. If the admitted patient is HIV positive, he should already be investigated for hepatitis B, C, and other STDs. We have not been provided any information whether this patient is hepatitis B or C positive or not, whether they have checked the state of the patient or not, we have been provided with information only that the patient is HIV positive. After how many months he can do nursing job, he can start or resume the job if uh, after the six months, if all the follow-up uh, uh, serologies came out to be negative. Welcome. Yes, Dr. Skimi, please unmute yourself. 
Good day, sir. Good morning, sir. Good, good morning. Yes, sir. Please, I have two questions. Go ahead. I'm not sure about the answer, the response you gave when talking about, about how to respond to the nurse. When she asked, he asked, why are you not taking the sample of the patient? Why are you not checking the... How do we respond to the nurse when the nurse asks, uh, asks us that? Why are we not taking... he is saying to me in a layman terms. Let's talk in a layman terms. He is saying to me that, please go ahead and check the hepatitis B and C status of the patient yes. and let me know whether he is positive or negative. So that will this bring is, confidence. This is the breakage in the confidentiality of the patient. The patient can sue you in the court. Okay, but is that what we tell the nurse in the, for an exam scenario? That's what I want to know. Is that, can I just tell the nurse that um, I can't tell you because this will break the confidentiality of, of my... Of course, patient. this is the answer. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. My second okay. question is with regards to the uh, um, hepatitis C and starting DAAs. Mm -hmm. Do we, the, which of the tests are we talking about? Is it the anti-hepatitis C, um, anti-HCV, or you have to have a hepatitis C viral RNA before well, before we start the DAA. First of all, I will answer your question bit depth. First of all, clarify your mind right now. Suppose I am getting HCV positive needle right now today. I am getting HCV positive needle. Yes, I cannot do anything. There is no PEEP available for hepatitis C. I have yes, to wait for a couple of months. I will repeatedly check my serology. What is serology? Anti-HCV. Anti-HCV. If, if it came out to be positive, then I will go for the PCR. Now, what is the logic behind? Why I'm not starting the treatment just on anti-HCV being positive? Why? Because in 20% of the patient, yes, in 20% of the cases, HCV, hepatitis C, clears himself automatically. Okay, so, so I will go for the PCR. If PCR is positive, I will start DAAs. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Dr. Shaheen, please unmute yourself. Yes, sir. I have two questions, sir. First, uh, if wife, he's not willing to tell, will we break confidentiality? If he's I'm not... Telling uh, you. I'm telling you, we have to break the confidentiality. Why? Because still, there are 0.3% chances of HIV, 3% chances of HCV, 33% chances of HBV. Right. And sir, hepatitis B and HIV PEEP, can you please mention the names only? Yes. They are uh, different regimes which they are following. It depends upon, like, they are in, in some uh, places, they are giving uh, ropinavir, retonavir, and entakever. There are different regimes. But for that, you can mention retonavir, ropinavir, and entakever. They are complex regimes. They are different, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I mean to say, recommendations. But the commonly followed one is that. There are other regimes also, which are being approved by WHO. Any other questions? Please unmute yourself. You are not using your name 0507. Hello, doctor. <clears throat> yes, go ahead. If this nurse is a female and she is pregnant, mm -hmm. Any, any change? Is that treatment? No, there is no change in the treatment, but there will be some change in the medications which you are using for the PEEP. Secondly, if this happens in the last trimester, of course, he will not be HBV positive at that time. 
because zero conversion needs some time. So you have to give the prophylaxis that is the antibodies to the new born child. Okay, thank you. Because why? Because there is risk of vertical transmission, not just for hepatitis B, but but also for the C and HIV. And what we can intervene, we can give newborn, we can provide newborn with the anti, uh, sorry, uh, uh, antibody for hepatitis B. And it should be provided within 12 hours of the birth. Okay, with this, we are uh, having one other station and uh, one other station will be of uh, Dr. Nancy. Dr. Nancy, are you with us? Okay, Dr. Nancy is not over here. Dr. Lavanya, are you with us? Dr. Lavanya, please unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Okay. So, are you ready for your session five? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Okay, rather I'm giving you station two. We have yes, done sir. The my schedule the yes. station two. My schedule is station two. I'm giving you station two. Okay. Okay. I'm sharing my screen for you. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, take your three minutes, then we will start the station.
Dr. Lavani, are you ready? Yes. Sir. Okay. I'm giving you timer. And your time starts now. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Lavanya. May I mm -hmm. confirm that I'm talking to Mr. Akram, 30 year old? Yes, I am. And uh, today I'm here to ask you a few questions related to your health. Is that all right? Absolutely all right. And while we talk, I might write down some notes, but rest assured, I, my attention will be with you and it will remain confidential. Is that all right? All right. Okay. Uh, could you tell me more about what brought you to hospital today? I don't know what's going on with me. I'm having some racing and pissing of heart and it's been, I believe, for the last three months. And now it's getting worse and now. So, uh, it, did it come on suddenly or gradually? Uh, three months back, it started gradually. Okay. So, is it there all the time or, or uh, is there anything that brings it on? I don't think so that anything is bringing it on according to my information. But yeah, it is not all the time around. Okay. So, what time of the day do you notice it more? It can happen anytime, even in the morning, in the noon, at the night. And uh, are you particularly anxious when this happens? I mean, absolutely. Okay. And is it regular or irregular? I mean, do you feel your heart raising? Like when it raises, is it regular or irregular? Tap for the patient on the table, and the patient is tapping regularly. Okay. So it is regular. Okay. Uh, so do you also have? Uh, uh, do you notice it during your sleep? I mean, mm, I was not getting up from the sleep because of because of uh, the palpitation thing. Okay, and now do you also have any sweating associated with it? Yes. Okay, you also have sweating, is it like uh, during the palpitations? How long mm -hmm. does each episode last when you get the palpitations? Mm, I think about fifteen minutes might be or thirty minutes. And after that, you feel normal, is it? Yes. Okay. How many times a day you get it? I'm getting it, um, I believe, might be once, might be twice. Sometimes I'm not getting it in the whole day. Okay. And uh, do you also have any dizziness when this happens? Mm, no. Have you ever lost consciousness? No. And uh, do you notice it more while you're exercising or when you're exerting yourself? Um, no. Okay. Any chest pain? No. Any difficulty in breathing? Mm, no. And uh, uh, I mean, your notes tell me that you also have uh, you've been have suffering from depression for some time, and also an anxiety disorder, and. Mm -hmm. uh, are you on regular follow-up for that? I am in the regular follow-up, but what I believe is that my anxiety is better, much control, but depression is worsening. Okay. So are you on medication for that? Yes. I am taking something called Proxetine, 20 milligram at night. Okay. Uh, any other medication other than Proxetine? Uh, no. Uh, so you're on paroxetine. Uh, any change in the dose of medication? No. When were you diagnosed with this uh, depression? About six months back. 
Okay, so depression and anxiety was diagnosed recently. And uh, I'll also ask you some general questions which might not be seen related. So have you noticed any fever? No. Uh, any changes in your weight? Yes, I believe that I'm losing the weight. Okay, so how much of weight have you been losing? Mm, I think that recently I have lost about four kilograms of the weight. Okay, uh, and for on over how long have you lost it? it? Might be over two months. Okay, so I've lost four kilograms over two months. That is very significant. And uh, any lumps or bumps anywhere in the body? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, and any changes in appetite? Sorry. I have some lumps and bumps in my neck. They are small lumps. Okay. 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 Uh, any infection, any soreness of throat or any uh, anything like that? No. Any dental uh, uh, caries? No. I mean, any problem with the teeth? So, um, uh, uh, any changes in appetite? No. You have not noticed any change in your appetite. So, um, and any night sweats? No. You have not had any night sweats. Okay. So, you've been having uh, loss of weight and some lumps along with the palpitations. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, any change in your bowel habits? No. Uh, any free, any uh, like any hard stools or any loose stools, anything like that? No. Okay. Any feeling of throwing up? No. Any difficulty in swallowing? No. Any tummy pain? I am having the tummy pain all over my tummy. Okay. So it's the all over your tummy. Is there anything yes. that makes it better? Nothing is making it better. Occasionally, not regularly, but occasionally, sometimes in these three or four months, sometimes I also get constipation, but it is not remaining all the time with me. Okay. Have you noticed any shakiness of your hands? Mm, yes. Okay, so can you describe it? Yes, I feel that my fingers are shaking. Uh, is it there all the time or only when you get the uh, palpitations? Uh, I mean, sorry, pal uh, raising of the heart? Mm, I believe that uh, it is coming with the racing and pacing of heart. Okay, so each time you're having a raising, you're also having shaking as okay. Mm -hmm. uh, any, um, any weather preferences? Yes, I am not preferring the hot weather. You're finding it uncomfortable in hot weather. Okay. Any changes in vision? No. So, uh, any, uh, okay, is it that you noticed a small lump? Is it one single lump that you noticed in your throat or is it many small Two lumps? Two or three lumps in my neck. Okay, is it on the side or is it in the middle? Sides. <laughs> Uh, and uh, um, okay, any breath? You said there's no breathlessness. Okay. And uh, any tingling or numbness anywhere in the body? No. Uh, okay. So other than your depression, uh, any any rash anywhere? No. Any change in water works? What change you exactly want to ask? Uh, Okay, so is there any, uh, like, uh, I mean, uh, is, it the, is it a regular quantity? I mean, you, I need burning while passing water. Any change in the quantity of your water works than previous? No. Okay, any frothiness? No. Any blood? No. Okay. And, um, okay, so other than your depression and anxiety, do you have any other illness that I should know of? Yes. Nowadays, they are telling me that your blood pressures are going high. Somebody is telling me that this is white coat something. And other person was saying to me that you need to get evaluated by checking it at the home. 
Okay. Uh, is it on and off the rise in blood pressure? Yes. Okay. Do you also have any headaches? Yes. Uh, so how often do you get the headaches? Not very often, but when I am getting, it is quite severe. Pulsatile. Okay, which part of the head is it? Like? All of my head. And no problem with vision, is it? Like? No. And which part of the day do you tend to get more headache? Is it the morning or evening or no change? No specific time. Okay, very good all the time. And if you if you were to grade it on a scale of ten, as it like how severe is the headache? Zero, might no be. Pain mm -hmm. Might be seven. Okay. So uh, other than the high blood pressure, uh, do you have high blood sugars also? No. Okay. Any admissions anywhere any time in the past? Yes. About two months back, I was admitted in the hospital with a blood pressure of one eighty by hundred. Okay. And were you given any medication during that time? I don't know. They were pushing something in my blood channel, but they were not telling me. Okay. And did they ask you to take any medication on a regular basis for your blood pressure? No. They were advising me to check it properly, but because of my business commitments, I was unable to check. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, any surgeries in the past? No. And uh, you, you, you said you are on paroxetin, and other than paroxetin, you're not on any other medication. No. Any allergies? No. And uh, any history of similar illness in the family? Yes. My mother, she is known case of hyperthyroidism. Okay. My dad, he is having something called renal artery stenosis he is getting very high blood pressure one of my brother one of my brother got something called ibs constipation variant um, okay. any i mean okay. two minutes from now okay do you smoke a lot i love smoking so how, many, how many sticks over how long? About 50 sticks per day for last five years. Smoking is injurious to health and I would suggest to stop smoking. And do you drink alcohol? No. And uh, uh, how has this been affecting you? What do you do for your living, Mr. I told you, I'm a businessman. Okay, okay. And how has this been affecting your daily life and routine? I don't know, but I'm not comfortable with these palpitations. And uh, okay, who lives with you at home? So I am attributing my anxiety and depression towards my recent business loss. Mm -hmm. I have lost, I think, million of pounds in my business. And who lives with you at home? My wife. And uh, okay, so do you have any concerns, Mr. Akram? A lot of concerns for you today. Do you think that my palpitations are because of my anxiety? Uh, uh, there is a possibility that your palpitations are because of anxiety, but even uh, but you, you are also giving other symptoms like some lumps and uh, uh, I mean some constipation. So we have to work you up further, and we can't just discard it as due to anxiety. Do you think do that paroxetine is killing me? Um, it doesn't look like the symptoms are related to paroxetine. Why I am losing weight? Uh, so there are certain there are some possibilities that we must rule out. First, you must do a set of blood tests on you. It could be uh, something in a big, that causing the palpitation. The same thing is causing your loss of weight also. So we should look into it first. Do a what it can uh, be. I mean, it is possible. What is the possible? Uh, it can be. It, it can be. It can be. Uh, I mean, it's a rare possibility. It could be a malignancy, or it could be something to do with your thyroid. Malignancy, or, or it, thyroid, I mean, malignancy. Is a jar All gone? Yes, is is, it could be cancer. Okay. One minute for reflection, then we will move ahead.
Okay. Please uh, give a very crispy history of your case to our participants. It should include only positive findings, a very crispy okay. history. Okay, so this patient uh, presented palpitations uh, and on taking a detailed history, he has episodes of intermittent headache along with weight loss. And uh, uh, he also has some, uh, I mean, develops some sweating uh, during the palpitations and some lumps in the neck. And he has had a recent uh, admission for a particularly high blood pressure. And he's a known case of depression and anxiety who's on paroxetin. Okay. Before we go towards your differentials, can you please tell me how many cups of coffee he is using per day? Forgot to ask, sir. Hmm? Forgot to ask, sir. Okay. Do you think this is relevant? Yes, sir. You can, caffeine can induce palpitations. Okay. Which illicit drug he is using? Yes, sir. That was, I mean, I poorly managed time. I wanted to ask it in the end. <laughs> okay. Any over the counter medication he is using? Any link? of these palpitations with the worsening of anxiety. Worsening? I, I didn't get you, sir. Worsening? Have you, uh, are you asking him, like when you're having the anxiety, when you are under stress, do you think that at that time, your palpitations are getting worse? I asked it the other way around. He said when he's anxious, he's getting palpitations. He said, Palpitations and anxiety go together. Okay. So, what are your differentials? He has lumps and loss of weight. So, he must be worked up for uh, and headache also. Headache. So, pheochromocytoma is a possibility, even though it is very rare. We have to rule that out. Just list down your probable top three differentials. Okay. Uh, so, pheochromocytoma, um, underlying malignancies were causing hypercalcemia and uh, thyroid would be down with maybe multiple endocrine neoplasia with Dr. Manier, whenever you are telling your differential to your examiner, list down very clear diagnosis. See to examiner that the top differential is pheochromocytoma. My second differential is don't say something linked to thyroid. Exactly tell hypothyroidism or if you want to say, Hyper say hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism. Okay, again list down your differentials in order of preference. Okay, so the first top differential would be pheochromocytoma. Uh, and uh, second could be an underlying malignancy causing hypercalcemia. And third no, could again, be hyper... Again, see, see, examiner will cut your marks. He will not speak anything. He will just cut your marks. You are saying underlying malignancy leading to hypercalcemia. Which underlying malignancy you're talking about? Lung, but no cough. <laughs> exactly name the malignancy. Yes, I don't even... Okay. okay, what's your third differential? Hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism. Thyroid. Okay. okay, so how will you thoroughly investigate your case? Uh, first, we will do a full blood count mm -hmm. to rule out anemia and then ESR and CRP. Mm -hmm. And uh, he will. Uh, Why do you require... want to go for CRP? Not necessary. So ESR will. Then you should not mention it. Go ahead. And then, uh, since he has lumps in the neck, he will need an ultrasound uh, scanning of the neck and uh, urinary venile uh, VMA for pheochromocytoma. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, uh, TSH. Okay. And electrolytes, 
sodium potassium calcium especially okay and how we so initially if it is pure chromocytoma he will require a combined alpha and beta blocker to control his blood pressure mm -hmm. that's and it his symptom should also be addressed uh, his anxiety but, should be addressed he will be but, under a multidisciplinary mm -hmm. okay i am giving a feedback Dr. Lawania, first of all, whenever you are telling your differentials or your management points, you should be very crystal clear. Why? Because get ready for the cross-questioning from the examiners. You should list down your differentials in the order of preference in the reflection time. Ask yourself, why I am putting this differential on the top why this one is not included in my list and why this one is on the third, number one. Number two thing is that whenever you are dealing with investigations, tell in a very smooth way, tell in a fashion, number one, investigations to rule in your top diagnosis, number two, investigations to rule out your other differentials number three investigations to seek etiology of your diagnosis number four investigations to seek or search for the complication of your diagnosis If you're thinking about few chromocytoma, I'm telling about you. I'm not giving a feedback on the scenario, what was the diagnosis. Your top diagnosis was few chromocytoma. So start from the baseline, ESR. Okay, you want to see anemia, good, ABC. Then tell all the investigations of few chromocytoma. Mm -hmm. Serum, catecholamine. Urinary, catecholamine. Mm -hmm. Urinary, Vinyl mendelic acid. Urinary metanephrine. Abdominal MR scan. MRI of the abdomen. Then, second thing, according to your narration, I am speaking about your differential. You want to rule out your other differentials. That was hyperthyroidism. Mention thyroid profile. Mention thyroid scan. Then, of course, you will check for the complications. Check for the complications of pheochromocytoma. And the main complication is HTN. It can lead to renal failure. It can lead to heart failure. It can lead to peripheral vascular disease. You have to work up for them at least go for urine DR, urine complete examination, ultrasonography of the kidney. Go for echocardiography. Okay. Investigations so, and their four headings. You have written three diagnoses on the paper. First, you will, uh, first heading is investigations to rule in your top diagnosis number two investigations to rule out other differentials number three investigations to check the etiology of your top diagnosis number four investigations to check for the complications of your top diagnosis now coming to this case we have been provided that mr x having uh, he's a young male 30 years old married having something called palpitations he is having known case of depression and anxiety as you're going in you're confidently taking the history i have no issue with your history except at the few points you are successfully exploring sweatings palpitations you are exploring tremors, headaches, not asking about the flushing of the face. 
and you're making your mind that this patient is having few chromocytoma because he's also giving the history of hypertension. We are not going to the BP of today. It can be normal. But he is giving us the history of the previous HTM. Even he was admitted in the hospital with a BP of 180 by 110 or, or 100. So this is very right thing that you are thinking about pheochromocytoma. I have no issue with it. Literally no issue. My issue starts that my student is not exploring and ruling out other differentials. That is palpitations, you can need to IV drug abuse. Might be cocaine. Palpitations because of caffeine abuse. Palpitations because of panic disorders. Now, going ahead, this patient is having few chromocytoma. I have no issue. I personally believe that all the participants out there have no issue with this diagnosis. But What's the problem? Problem is with the constipation, tummy pains, depression. And interestingly, you were able to find out that this depression started just six months back. Like the things are getting worsened for the last six months. It means that something is fishy in the last six months. Tummy pains, constipation, Depression. So you are very right. You will put the diagnosis of hypercalcemia. We are agreeing with you. We have no issue with it. Going ahead, we have to explain the lumps and bumps. Lumps and bumps in the neck. With some weather preferences that is saying to us that I don't prefer the hot weather. Means he is heat intolerant. Lumps and bumps in the neck with hyperthyroidism. Now, lumps and bumps are not being explained by anything. Why? No sore throat, no respiratory symptoms, no any other infections, no fevers. Why he is having lumps and bumps with the weather preference? What do you think, Dr. Lavanya, now? Hyperthyroidism, sir. Hyperthyroidism is a good differential. I am not negating it. But it is not Did going... Did you really cast them off thyroid? Will it cause... Yes, 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 yes. This is the diagnosis. So will it cause weather preference, sir? That was that, I mean, that, I, that's why I was talking. It can present without weather preferences. Sometimes and medullary clastoma thyroid will cause hypocalcemia sir, or, or hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia is because of hyperparathyroidism. Okay, sir. Okay. That is the case of men to men B. Men to B. Men to B. No, see, I am not telling you anything. You are yourself telling me that this is medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, right? Yes. You are telling me that this is few chromocytoma, right? You are telling me yes, that sir. this is hypercalcemia, right? But why yes, you are confused in the exam? Because you are not joining all the things. You are not joining all the facts. Okay? So, be confident. In the one minute, one minute of reflection, trust me, this is a golden time for you to organize yourself. Okay, Dr. Lavania? Yes, sir. So, Ex ask yourself why this patient is having hypercalcemia. Why lumps and bumps with hyperthyroidism? Okay, this is hyperthyroidism. We are agreeing with you. No issue. Why lumps and bumps in the neck? Ask yourself. Think about it. Think more. Think more. Think more. So you will know. Sorry, this is meant to A, not to B. This is just a slip of tongue. This is meant to oh, okay. A. A. Meant to A. This is the case of men 2A. Okay? So, these are the points. Why we are losing our diagnosis? Because we have taken a very good history. History was complete. Okay, there were some issues in the social history. Like, 
illicit mm-hmm. drugs and the caffeine like that. But almost, history of preventing illness mm-hmm. was almost complete. But why you are struggling with your diagnosis? Because you are not putting all the things together. I said multiple under the near pressure first, then I was not confident, so I just I mean, did not say it the next time. <laughs> it happens, it happens, it happens. <laughs> no problem. Mm-hmm. By the way, good performance. And uh, now in the investigations, of course, you will investigate uh, everything. We have discussed about the fucromocytoma. All the investigation of fucromocytoma we have already mentioned. And um, in the uh, thyroid, majority CA of thyroid, we will go for serum calcitonin level. We will go for, of course, um, FNAC, biopsy, uh, uh, thyroid scan. Of -hmm. course, we will surely go for the FNAC of uh, the lymph nodes. And no, we will not. Rather, we will take on board the multidisciplinary team. Going ahead with this case, we have the second thing that is hyperparathyroidism. For that, what we will do? We will do one chemistry that is calcium, phosphate. Mm -hmm. We'll go for alkaline phosphate is. We will surely go for PTH level. And MIBG scan, MIBG scan. No, 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 not MIBG scan. This is, uh, uh, this is the scan. The name is from the S. I'm skipping the name. Sorry, the mental block. Cis, cis, something called cyst. Um, uh, something. Somebody should write the name of that scan which we do in the hyperparathyroidism. I'm skipping. Yes, cyst MIBG scan. Okay. Okay, sir. And we have to do, we have to do, okay? So now what we will do, we will manage the patient accordingly. For the few chromocytoma, of course, we will go so ahead. Urinary BMA is also done, sir. Urinary, urinary yes, yes, yes. We have discussed all the investigations of uh, the few chromocytoma, urinary VMA, urinary catecholamines, urinary metanephrines, serum catecholamines, MR scan of the abdomen. Okay. Then, of course, now the management. In the management, alpha and beta blocker combined, and ultimate option is the surgery. You are not mentioning the surgery. Okay. For the high per parathyroidism, you have to control the calcium. Initial step is IV fluids. Not controlled, then what you will do? You will go for this phosphonate. Sometimes, sometimes they are mentioning calcitonin, but it is not being evaluated in the treatment of hypercalcemia as such. Then, if still it is not uh, being treated, like hypercalcemia is not being controlled, we will go ahead with parathyroidectomy. Yes, Dr. Shaheen, I mentioned the calcitonin level. Of course, for the medullary CA, the option is surgery. But before that, don't forget to mention the staging CTs. Dr. Lavanya, do you have any questions or concerns? No, sir. Only if anybody no. wants to ask a question or concern. Dr. Abdul Latif, do you have any question? If you have any question, please unmute yourself. If anybody wants to ask a question, please use the raise hand option. Okay. So uh, this was a very nice discussion and a healthy discussion. And uh, there are a few mistakes which we have already corrected of Dr. Lavani. And Dr. Chetan, please unmute yourself. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, I have two three questions. Uh, first thing, do we check everything in the urine, you mean? Because VMA uh, is not enough? Look, if you are mentioning the investigations, of course, you have to mention all. But recently, we are checking two things, metanephrines and VMA. But yes, nothing wrong if you can mention serum catecholamines, but might be why, might be your examiners want to listen to it. But you're right, very sir. right. Nowadays, VMA and the metanephrines. Yes, right, second sir. question. 
second one, sir. Uh, do we need CT scan instead of MRI for the abdomen? MR, MR, MR. MR scan, right? Yes. Okay, sure, sure. sure. MR. Thank you, sir. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, welcome. Thanks to all of you for being with us and uh, having good questions, a very high yield questions, and thanks to all participants. So with this, we are concluding our session. Inshallah, hopefully we will meet next Sunday. Have a good Sunday. Enjoy your weekend. Goodbye.